free to stop me uh, when I'm presenting the work. I'm sure. not sure what kind of self-supervised learning work has been presented, uh, but this one is uh, mostly about uh, connecting Just uh, different, add, different. We had uh, speakers from uh, different, uh, basically, research groups. Mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, authors of SimClear paper, SimClear version 2, uh, SUAP approach, mm -hmm. and a few others uh, based on self-supervised learning. So what you present is going to complement those presentations. Yes, hopefully. Uh, okay, so I'm going to mainly talk about uh, CMCM, uh, the simplification of uh, uh, current uh, state-of-the-art methods for self-supervised learning, uh, but I'm also going to mention a bit beyond that and uh, uh, mainly talk about uh, MoCo plus uh, BIT. Uh, feel free to stop me if you have questions. Uh, so, oh, by the way, how, how much time do I have? Uh, uh, you have maximum one hour, but uh, okay. you shouldn't take more, right? Okay, okay. Uh, so recently self-supervised representation learning uh, is a, a quite trending topic. Uh, it's not just limited to uh, computer vision, uh, but it's also uh, revolutionized uh, natural language processing. Uh, if you guys are familiar with uh, uh, words like BERT from Google or GPT uh, series uh, work from OpenAI. Uh, and for computer vision, it seems like uh, we are uh, getting there. Uh, so to provide some supporting data point, uh, in 2019, uh, unsupervised representation learning uh, when evaluated on ImageNet uh, reaches at most 65% uh, top one accuracy. And that's like a big gap uh, compared to ImageNet supervised methods, uh, 76. Uh, but in 2020, uh, last year, uh, the gap is uh, significantly closed. Um, we can comfortably reach 75% uh, uh, accuracy uh, on ImageNet. So it's developing very fast and uh, hopefully uh, we can uh, train useful representations from unlabeled visual data uh, very soon and uh, get good uh, results. Uh, I put a, a, a stereos here uh, because uh, uh, this is a relatively weak baseline uh, for ImageNet supervised method, 76.5. Uh, it's from the original uh, ResNet uh, residual network paper. Uh, and with uh, more advanced uh, tricks and uh, techniques, uh, this number can be significantly improved. So there's uh, still a gap. Um, so, so what happened? Uh, what caused these uh, uh, amazing uh, progress? Uh, in MoCo, uh, which was published in 2019, uh, it showed a result of a 60% uh, uh, ImageNet linear uh, evaluation. And in February uh, 2020, uh, SimClear was proposed. Hopefully you guys are familiar with that. And uh, uh, it pushed uh, this number to close uh, to 70. Uh, and then later on, uh, uh, a work called the Bio, uh, Bootstrap Your Unlatent, was published, and uh, uh, the gap is uh, further closed. Uh, so around 74 compared to 76.5. And uh, uh, there's another work uh, uh, called the Swav. Uh, that's published concurrently with uh, uh, with bio, uh, and that's one of the best numbers we can achieve uh, there. Um, so the field is developing very fast, uh, but a common theme among all these approaches uh, is CMS networks. Um, so to give you a, a simplified view of supervised learning with Siamese uh, network learning. In, self, in supervised learning, what we have is uh, an image. Uh, we act, 
extract a view of this image we call X, and then uh, we run it through an encoder, uh, get a, a prediction Y. And this prediction is uh, uh, compared against the ground truth uh, pre uh, label Y. Um, and some similarity loss is uh, uh, attached to, to that to train the encoder. But these self-supervised learning methods uh, actually uh, extract uh, two views uh, of the same image. Uh, so one is X, the other is X prime. And they uh, these two views uh, run through the uh, some weight sharing encoders and get uh, two predictions. So one prediction uh, denoted as P and the other uh, P prime. And uh, they are, uh, there are some similarity loss uh, between them. So the, the reason why such self-supervised learning, uh, self-supervised learning methods are successful uh, is that because in supervised learning, we have ground truth labels, um, but in self-supervised, uh, we do not have labels. Uh, so it's a smart way to generate a pseudo label, uh, P prime, to supervise uh, uh, the encoder in some way. But does it work? Um, not quite, because uh, undesired trivial solution exists for such a, uh, uh, um, architecture. Um, so a very uh, easy to think of uh, um, trivial solution is just to predict constant for everything. So no matter what image you get, this encoder just to predict a constant uh, value. And because there's only a similarity loss uh, used to uh, evaluate uh, how this encoder is doing, uh, it I mean, it I can achieve the perfect score uh, with just uh, uh, this trivial solution. So in the literature, there are uh, many countering strategies uh, used um, against uh, learning such trivial solution. Uh, and the most common one uh, is what we call contrastive learning. Um, and in contrastive learning, uh, it explicitly requires additional dissimilarity uh, for views from different images. And it still keeps the similarity for views from the same image. Uh, so predicting constant is uh, no longer optimal um, because it's enforcing the gap between uh, the views from different images. Um, and a popular loss function uh, people use these days is called the info NCE loss. Uh, it's actually a very similar, in a si very similar form to softmax loss. Um, so you have two pre predictions, P and P prime, and you uh, compare them uh, with a, a, a dot product and divided it by some temperature parameter. Um, and uh, this is for positive pairs and uh, there's a negative pair and this is negative pairs are actually formed by views from uh, other images. Um, and it's taking the log of, uh, uh, of this exponential uh, terms uh, some of exponential terms. Um, so it's very similar to uh, uh, softmax. Um, but there are drawbacks for this info NCE loss. Um, uh, for example, it usually requires a sufficiently large number of uh, negatives uh, for good performance. Um, so Steam clear uh, actually uses a quite large batch size, uh, 4,000, uh, at least in their experiment, to provide uh, reasonable uh, negatives uh, within batch. And uh, it can be expensive because uh, having 4,000 batch size requires uh, multi-node training. So it will require more uh, than eight uh, GPUs. Um, on the other hand, uh, this momentum contrastive method uh, 
uses a momentum queue to store negatives. So it is a smart strategy to decouple the batch size uh, from the negative set size. Uh, but it still requires additional memory overhead. Uh, and compared to SimClear, it's uh, indeed more complex because one has to maintain uh, this uh, uh, momentum queue and has to maintain a separate uh, momentum encoder. Uh, here is a visualization of the two. Uh, so on the left is a sim clear that um, it builds an affinity uh, uh, matrix. Uh, so it's a full n by n matrix. Uh, but for the momentum queue, you only need uh, positive uh, in the positives in the batch and the negative are uh, in the in the gray in the shaded uh, um, boxes are actually from the momentum queue. Um, and there are other strategies uh, beyond the contrastive learning. Uh, so one is uh, proposed in SWOF. Uh, it's uh, there's a key word for uh, the countering strategy in SWOF is a balanced online st online clustering. Uh, and what it does is uh, a cluster center based output representation uh, where the prediction P is to use to predict, uh, to pick the center of a uh, uh, of cluster. And uh, when they are predicting uh, different representation, uh, different uh, cluster centers, they make sure that the cluster sizes uh, of each cluster are balanced um, with a special algorithm called Syncorn. Um, and constant solution is less likely because uh, otherwise all points are assigned to a single uh, cluster. So if everything is predicting constant and uh, we have a set of cluster centers, there's always going to be a, a, a most close to cluster center a most closed cluster center, and everything is assigned to that cluster center. Uh, and that's contradicting the balancing uh, requirement uh, of, uh, of online clustering. So that's a subtle way uh, to combat this issue. Um, and then finally, there's the uh, bio, and it introduces an additional um, multi-layer perception predictor and then uses a momentum encoder uh, to, uh, as a teacher uh, for, uh, for the target. So the momentum encoder is actually very simple. Um, it's just uh, taking the history of uh, uh, the trained encoder during, pre during, during training, um, and it will run an exponential moving average on top of that. So the most recent uh, weights uh, from the, uh, the online encoder is uh, uh, weighting more uh, than the previous ones. So it's getting constantly updated. Um, and the weights are not updated by gradients. Its weights are uh, entirely based on uh, copying of uh, uh, the online uh, encoder. Uh, but then the drawback for this momentum encoder is that uh, it needs to maintain two copies of weights uh, in the memory, uh, which sometimes can be uh, expensive uh, to do. Um, so it's actually a very intriguing thing why bio works. Uh, so it introduces uh, two additional things. Uh, so one is a, the predictor and the other is a uh, momentum encoder. And uh, in, in our work, we, we want to see which one of these uh, is more critical uh, compared to uh, uh, for making things, for making uh, bio work. Um, so uh, that's the motivation of uh, uh, this approach uh, to do simple CMS network. Um, uh, for self-supervised learning. Um, and what we show is that indeed uh, we can do 
uh, self-supervised representation learning uh, without uh, lots of things. So one thing is uh, uh, the negatives uh, from SimClear and Moco. The other is uh, online clustering uh, techniques uh, that requires balanced cluster, uh, cluster sizes from SWALF. Um, and then we successfully removed the bio, uh, uh, BIOS momentum encoder. Uh, and it means that uh, maybe the predictor uh, is uh, more important in that sense, but we'll discuss that later. Uh, and compared to MoCo, it removes uh, both uh, negatives uh, and uh, momentum encoder. Uh, so the overall architecture is something like this. Uh, we have an image X, uh, we have uh, two views, x1 and x2. We feed it into uh, a weight sharing encoder. So the, the, the weights are uh, identical for uh, both encoders. And then uh, through a predictor, uh, the uh, edge, uh, one view's uh, prediction is uh, compared against uh, the other encoder's uh, uh, prediction. Uh, with uh, a similarity loss. And then note that he, we only update the weights of uh, uh, the encoder and the predictor on the left side, and we do stop gradient on the right side. So the encoder uh, on the right side is always uh, just copying weights uh, from the first one, or you can just view that as a single copy of weights uh, in the memory. So here's a summary of uh, different uh, CMS architectures uh, we explored in this paper. Um, so for SimClear, there are uh, parallel two encoders uh, and the gradients uh, for both similarity and dissimilarity uh, signals are uh, being backpropagated to uh, both sides. Uh, for bio, it has a, a additional predictor. It has a momentum encoder, which uh, that's uh, moving average over the online encoder. Uh, and the gradients is updated uh, through uh, the predictor and the encoder on the left side. So for SWAF, uh, uh, the extra thing is uh, for SyncHorn and uh, algorithms that requires balanced cluster sizes. And for SimCM, uh, uh, we do not require momentum encoder. Uh, by default, we have a predictor uh, and the gradient is updated on the, on the left side. Um, do we have questions? Oh, it should be fine. Um, so here is a PyTorch like code for uh, CMCM. Um, I think I explained uh, most of the things uh, in, the, in the previous uh, uh, graph but there are several additional nodes. So first one is uh, we use L2 normalized cosine similarity by default. Uh, so uh, there's a normalized uh, operation uh, in the end. And then we have a symmetrized loss um, because um, the, the weights are shared uh, on the left side and on the right side. Uh, so the 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 uh, loss can be computed twice uh, uh, there. Uh, so we call it a symmetrized symmetrized loss. Um, sorry, and then the gradient is only back propagated uh, through the predictor. So there's a stop gradient uh, operation uh, there. So this is Z equals c dot uh, detach. Um, yes. So then we had our empirical study uh, with uh, our basic setups. Uh, we use uh, Resonant 50 uh, and uh, three layer uh, projector M MLP as a default encoder. This projector MLP is a, is a hel very helpful trick from SimClear. Uh, we use a uh, sync batch norm uh, in our experiments. 
um, for the predictor MLP, uh, we actually followed a bottleneck structure. Uh, so it has a smaller hidden dimension and large, larger input output dimension. Uh, and this is uh, actually quite different from uh, uh, what bio had in their, uh, uh, in their predictor. Um, for pre-training, uh, we followed uh, standard uh, uh, strategies. Uh, so we just use SGD plus momentum as the default optimizer. Uh, we use a 512 uh, batch size, uh, which can fit in eight GPUs uh, in our experiment. Uh, we follow some default uh, base learning rate uh, uh, and uh, we use a hundred epoch uh, pre-training for analysis. Um, and for evaluation, uh, we use a linear class file on top of the uh, frozen ResNet uh, profile features. So one of the most, uh, most important signal for this work is that stop gradient uh, is actually a crucial thing uh, for CMCM. Uh, without it, uh, the representation collapse. Um, and by class, collapse, it means uh, it just predicts uh, constant vectors uh, uh, all the time. Uh, and we have to note that this is implicit when uh, one has a momentum encoder on the right side, because uh, as I said, the momentum encoder on the right side is just uh, copying weights uh, from uh, uh, the online encoder, and uh, it does not uh, receives a, a gradient by default. But uh, in our study, stop gradient uh, is uh, explicitly done uh, to prevent the representation from collapsing. Uh, so here we have a comparative study. Uh, so with stop gradient operation, it reach, reaches uh, a reasonable uh, image net top one performance. Uh, this is a 67.7. Um, it's lower than uh, the state of the art because uh, our setting is only training uh, for a shorter uh, period of time. Um, state of the art methods are uh, uh, results are achieved with a uh, much longer training. Um, but without uh, stop gradient, uh, when uh, the gradient is able to back propagate uh, to the encoder on the right side, uh, the representation collapse and top one accuracy is 0.1% uh, because ImageNet has a thousand classes and uh, random chance is uh, uh, about 0.1%. Um, we show it. Yes. Uh, could you uh, mention about how how to set your weight decay in USGD with momentum? Mm, we we used, if I remember correctly, uh, we used. Uh, are you asking about the values of weighted decay, or yeah. are you? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it's a. Uh, it's mentioned in the paper. Um, it it is, uh, and we did some study that it's actually quite robust to the uh, specific values of uh, uh, weight decay. Uh, yeah, when you but, use weight, weight decay somehow. It's very similar to the momentum update uh, encoder, right? Uh, are you talking about weighted decay or are you talking about momentum? Because because you weight, weight, sorry, you can see. Yeah, because weight decay is uh, similar to a L2 uh, regularizer. So you require the, the weight uh, to, to be small in terms of a L2, uh, uh, right? I think in SGD momentum, when you add weight decay, it means how how much uh, or, or, or the weights of the kept in the last iteration, right? It's not L2, right? If I- Wait, I thought, I, I thought momentum, 
So there are two types of momentum uh, I'm mentioning here. Uh, so SGD plus momentum. So that's uh, optimization uh, momentum. And there's a momentum encoder momentum. And that is uh, uh, like the EMA, the, the uh, moving average coefficient of, uh, of the weights. These two momentums are, are different. Um, so one, the first momentum is keeping uh, the gradient. It is about the gradient. It requires momentum because uh, SGD with mini, uh, with mini batch training is uh, uh, relatively noisy. Uh, so it, it needs a momentum to smooth the gradient. Uh, but the momentum encoder momentum is uh, uh, like directly operating on the weights, on the parameters. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's related, but uh, it's uh, different. Uh, anyway. Yeah, but anyway, uh, it's easy to set a, a weight decay parameter in the optimizer. Uh, we follow some default uh, parameters over there. Um, so we have uh, three plots to show, uh, uh, to visualize uh, the difference between uh, stop gradient and without stop gradient. So with the stop gradient, the train loss looks pretty healthy, uh, but without stop gradient, in the very first few uh, epochs, uh, the uh, the loss uh, goes to the minimal. So minus one is uh, uh, the lower bound uh, for uh, negative cosine similarity uh, or the cosine similarity. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, and it means everything is, uh, is similar there. Um, and the other monitor is uh, uh, this standard deviation of the prediction. So the prediction is uh, uh, like a hundred dimensional vector. And uh, if everything is uh, predicted as the same, then uh, you can imagine that a standard deviation uh, is going to be very, very low. So that's indeed the case. Uh, for the, for the red curve uh, without a stop gradient. Uh, for the stop gradient one, uh, it remains pretty high um, and it's actually maintaining uh, the value uh, of its upper bound. Uh, so D is the number uh, of dimensions of the, of the prediction. And we also monitored with uh, 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 K-nearest neighbor classifier, which is take the representation uh, uh, of the encoder and then run a k nearest neighbor uh, uh, classifier using that representation. Uh, so we can see that without the stop gradient, the k KNN accuracy uh, is increasing um, and reaches a, a pretty healthy level. Uh, but without the stop gradient, uh, although the loss is really low, uh, the representation itself is not that meaningful um, and it's not useful uh, for the k-nearest neighbor classifier. Um, and we also show that predictor is uh, relatively important. Um, so the default, um, um, in the default setting without, uh, with the stopper gradient, we can reach 77, uh, 67. And without predictor, uh, the representation also collapse. But uh, in that case, it's actually equivalent to, uh, to without a stop gradient, because uh, in this figure, uh, if you remove the predictor H um, and you, you force uh, uh, the symmetrized loss, so, uh, uh, one is treating uh, the left side as a target, the other is treating the right side as a target. Um, it's effectively uh, just uh, making the loss as uh, uh, half of the 
loss. Uh, so uh, it does not, uh, it's, it's actually equivalent to uh, without a stop gradient. So that's not surprising. Um, but we also tried a random predictor, uh, uh, which is just use randomly initialized weights uh, in the predictor edge, does not train it at all. Uh, and seems like it does not converge. Uh, we also tried not decaying the predictor learning rate. Uh, so predictor edge is uh, uh, having a constant learning rate and uh, other parts of the encoder, uh, I mean, other parts of the network is uh, uh, decaying uh, learning rate following uh, some, some schedule, for example, cosi schedule. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, it actually achieves a better performance and it becomes a default setting for our later explorations. Um, so predictor from this set of experiment uh, seems to be important. Uh, there's a drastically different behavior uh, if we do something to the predictor, but later, uh, we show that predictor can actually be removed and still remain uh, uh, a reasonable performance uh, with proper designs. Um, we also studied the different losses. So default, we use a cosine uh, similarity. We also tried with a soft max across entropy, uh, which is just treating the predictor edge as, a, as the output of a predictor H1 uh, as the, the logit uh, in softmax, uh, the other as a target. Uh, and uh, it works reasonably well, uh, although not as well as uh, cosine similarity. Um, but it relates to swap uh, out of the box uh, because swap uh, is using uh, a similar loss over there. Uh, we also tried whether symmetried, uh, symmetrized loss is important. Uh, um, we have the study uh, in, in, the, in the table of uh, bottom right. Uh, in the symmetried loss, uh, it's getting, uh, in the asymmetric loss, it's getting slightly lower performance, but it's not critical. And uh, we tried, Asymmetric version, but train uh, uh, with two x uh, uh, longer training, and it, it reaches a similar performance of symmetrized the loss. So that means symmetrized the loss is uh, uh, effectively making the training longer, uh, and in self-supervised learning, uh, training longer usually helps. Uh, so uh, that's a takeaway for this experiment. Um, and I have to highlight again that SimCM has this advantage over uh, bio uh, because it does not need to forward again on the momentum encoder when uh, computing the symmetrized loss uh, because the, the prediction is already there. You only need to uh, forward it uh, once. Uh, with the uh, online encoder. Um, we also studied batch normalization uh, in this paper. Uh, and we find that synchronized batch normalization uh, on each view separately uh, is important uh, for SIMCM. Uh, we didn't report uh, uh, like different variants of uh, a batch norm uh, in this paper, um, but we studied uh, batch norm uh, on the, uh, uh, the the MLPs uh, in the network, uh, and uh, there are uh, different behaviors uh, there. Uh, it's just a. Uh, uh, um, uh, interesting uh, to see. Um, and one important thing uh, we mentioned, we uh, have to note is the 
uh, weight decay uh, in our case is applied to uh, the batch norm parameters. Uh, it's different from bio simclear, uh, where uh, weight decay is not applied to uh, batch norm parameters. And we find that it, it seems to be important to maintain uh, SimCM's uh, uh, reasonable performance uh, uh, without uh, weight decay on the BM parameters, the, the training can be uh, uh, instable. Um, we also did uh, other basic settings like uh, batch size, uh, like learning rate and the weight decay. Um, and it seems like uh, they are all relatively robust. Um, for details, you can see that in the paper. Um, but the most intriguing thing uh, we want to uh, not study in this paper is the role of a stop gradient. And we propose a hypothesis of uh, the stop gradient uh, in the paper. Um, and the hypothesis is that it provides a different trajectory, optimization trajectory that uh, alternative alternates between uh, two sets of uh, variables. So one set of a variable is a network parameter, uh, theta. The other set of a uh, variable is uh, uh, the hidden representation for an image X. So suppose uh, uh, it's eta, uh, and eta is indexed by X. So for each X, it has a, a hidden representation. Um, and I mean, this is similar to uh, a k-means uh, clustering algorithm where uh, the parameters there in k-means is uh, the, uh, the cluster uh, centers and uh, the eta is uh, the cluster center assignment uh, for each uh, data point. And um, we propose an objective function that this network is, uh, is training. Um, so this loss function operates on uh, the theta parameter and the eta parameter. And it's taking uh, the expectation of uh, different images and different transformations of the images. So uh, how you sample views from different images, it can be random cropping, it can be uh, color jittering. Um, and it runs uh, an encoder F uh, on the transformed uh, view of, uh, of X uh, with the uh, theta parameter. And it compared the, the the output of the uh, the prediction uh, with some hidden representation eta x over there, um, um, and this op optimization uh, can be done uh, in an alternative fashion, where uh, one can fix eta and then uh, optimize the theta uh, with uh, normal gradient descent uh, SGD. Uh, uh, optimizers or other op optimizers. Um, and then once we have a fixed theta, so the encoder parameter, uh, the eta can be updated with uh, uh, the expectation of uh, all the transformations of, uh, of uh, X. Uh, um, so uh, it's a default, it, it's like, uh, the EM algorithm uh, in uh, k-means clustering or in uh, Gaussian mixture model uh, that uh, uh, alter alternates uh, between uh, two sets of uh, parameters. And, and uh, maybe this is uh, this is the reason it is not collapsing because it's kind of implicit memory. So mm -hmm. we don't need to have kind of explicit memory as we have in Moco. So by default, pre predictor had estimate the cluster centers. Uh, yes. And, and those cluster centers should be invariant to those augmentation transformations. So it's, yeah. it's kind of similar to SWAP because in SWAP we do swapping the cluster assignment between mm -hmm. different transformation of the same image. Mm -hmm. But here uh, we do not explicitly use the clusters, but 
the cluster centers that we estimate roughly should be invariant to those transformation or augmentation of the same image from the other encoder. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a good point. Um, I think, I mean, it's an interesting story that we actually started uh, the exploration with the swap uh, for behind this project, uh, and uh, through the process we uh, we uh, find some other like simplification of uh, swap over there, uh, and yeah. Uh, and later we decide to go with this one because this is a, a even simpler version with like simpler uh, loss design and uh, um, and the yeah. good thing is we don't need a large batch size. Um, for for SimCM we have a, a special case for this general algorithm. Um, it's a one step alternation. So theta is updated uh, with one step of uh, gradient uh, descent, and eta is updated with one sample of transformation because there's only one view sampled on the on the right side uh, to 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 train the uh, the encoder. Um, and we didn't mention about the role of a predictor in this uh, uh, framework so far, but our hypothesis of that is it can fill in the gap between a single sample uh, representation and the expectation uh, over there um, because uh, it's only sampling one simple uh, uh, one single example uh, it needs a predictor to regress the, the single example to the mean or expectation of uh, samples of, uh, over different transformations um, so we provided two uh, proof of concept experiment in uh, this work. Uh, one is a multi-step alternation uh, version of SimCM. So it will update Theta multiple times uh, with SGD uh, before it's updating Eta again. Uh, and what we find that's interesting is that uh, it actually gets better uh, results than the default SimCM uh, work. Uh, so um, in general, 1% uh, better if we take 100 step alternation. So you do 100 steps of gradient descent um, before you update uh, the eta. Um, um, in fact, uh, we believe it is, uh, uh, it, it has the same effect as a momentum encoder because momentum encoder is also taking uh, snapshots of uh, uh, of histories uh, of the entire history uh, of uh, uh, the online encoder and do weighted average over the of the snapshots uh, and in this case uh, it's taking a snapshot 10, 10 steps uh, before or 100 steps before and that seems to be uh, uh, this delayed process is uh, uh, is helpful for uh, uh, for representation learning. Um, so this proof concept is uh, uh, suggesting that alternative uh, alternating optimization is a is a valid formulation. Um, and the other proof of concept is uh, about our hypothesis of the predictor. Uh, so. Uh, we hypothesis that this predictor's output is actually uh, a moving average, uh, not a moving average, is an expectation of uh, all the transformations uh, uh, of the prediction. So uh, instead of having a predictor, we replaced it with a moving average of all the previous uh, uh, predictions on the same image um, and this is to approximate the expectation over there so instead of uh, uh, having a learned predictor we just uh, do uh, a moving average of all the previous uh, uh, predictions 
And what we find is that it can work to some extent, so not incredibly well. Um, so reaching 55% uh, compared to 68, but um, it's definitely doing something uh, rather than collapsing. Uh, um, so collapsing usually we reach uh, a chance performance. Um, so now we compared our method with uh, uh, other state-of-the-art uh, works. Uh, um, so one is Simclear, the other is Vocal, uh, third one's Bio, and then Swap. Uh, so we achieve uh, competitive performance over there. Um, so 70-ish uh, uh, performance. Uh, note that for Swap, uh, the performance is a little bit lower with our uh, reproduction because uh, we only used two views of the same image. We do not use uh, uh, additional crops uh, of, of the same image. Um, we view that as like a trick to improve performance, uh, but for fair comparison, uh, we just do uh, two views of all the frameworks. Uh, and Simsium has a uh, advantage similar to Moco. It has a uh, advantage uh, that's friend relatively friendly to batch size, uh, and uh, it has better uh, quality compared to Moco and Bio because it's momentum encoder free. You don't have to do extra coding uh, or maintenance for the momentum encoder. Uh, while still being competitive. Um, so the previous table is only showing ImageNet linear performance. Uh, in this table, I'm showing uh, uh, the downstream transfer. So as an example, it's for object detection uh, on the Pascal VOC benchmark. Um, and all methods seem to generally perform well, um, and they uh, can outperform ImageNet supervised pre-training. So uh, that's a good sign for unsupervised uh, learning. Um, um, and now I'm going to discuss something uh, quite philosophical. Um, so we are suspecting that CMS networks uh, is a bare minimum uh, for uh, unsupervised representation learning because uh, Siamese network is a, a very natural and effective way to learn um, invariance. So what it does is uh, it takes two views of the same concept or the same image, and then it explicitly asks uh, the network to say that uh, these two views should be invariant uh, uh, because they are similar after uh, running the encoder. And this is a data-driven way uh, to learn invariance, uh, which is a very important for learning uh, uh, the, the visual, uh, learning in vision. Um, and when easy invariance like uh, translation invariance can be baked into convolutions, uh, this is part of the reason why convolution networks are very successful because it has an inductive bias that uh, the, the representation is invariant to uh, translation or equivalent to translation. Uh, it's actually very challenging to uh, model more complex uh, transformations like different color, different scale, uh, different uh, rotations of the, of the concept. And uh, we argue that if learning such good uh, invariance is a, a integral part of uh, uh, learning good visual representations, then CMS network is uh, uh, at least uh, the, uh, a very strong baseline, a natural choice uh, for uh, learning invariance. Okay, now I'm done with the CM, uh, CMCM. Uh, I'm going to briefly mention our most recent work on uh, MoCo V3, and that's uh, on uh, MoCo plus 
vision transformers, uh, mainly about uh, Moco. Uh, so if you guys are not familiar with VIT, uh, it's a recent uh, work uh, from Google that shows uh, a transformer uh, without the inductive bias of translation invariance. Uh, it, it can be very effective uh, for um, uh, recognition, uh, specifically uh, uh, ImageNet, um, as long as you uh, train it uh, with uh, larger and larger data sets. Um, so here is a representative figure uh, from that paper. Um, and what they find is that with larger models uh, and uh, bigger uh, data sets, uh, translation invariance, such a inductive bias is no longer required and it can be learned uh, uh, with, with all the data. Um, so it's a natural question for us uh, to, to see whether translation invariance uh, can be learned uh, in this uh, CMS network way. Um, so uh, because VIT does not have this translation uh, invariance uh, uh, assumption. Um, so what there are main, there are three main observations uh, we have in that paper. The first one is uh, uh, existing self supervised learning frameworks are generally transferring well um, to BIT and it can yield uh, reasonable results. So here is a, a comparison uh, uh, between uh, ResNet 50, which is translation invariant versus VIT base uh, that uh, does not have such uh, inductive bias. Um, and what we find is that it seems like uh, contrastive learning based methods uh, like MoCo or uh, SimClear seems to be uh, performing relatively well uh, with a VIT uh, base, uh, whereas uh, uh, non-contrastive methods uh, seem to be uh, uh, relatively underperforming over there. So. Uh, they have different behaviors in different uh, backbones, but in general, uh, all such works can, uh, such frameworks can work uh, with VIT. Uh, the second observation, which is actually a call for research, is a uh, large scale, uh, a large batch size training seems to be uh, uh, a, a research topic and it's a, a challenging thing for VIT. Uh, what we observed is that it will uh, show dips uh, when it is uh, uh, throughout the training, when, when the training, uh, when the learning rate and uh, batch size is large. And it can be subtle because uh, the network can successfully recover uh, from uh, such dips and still continue training. Although uh, maybe it's not as good as uh, 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 like the entirely healthy one, but uh, it can still uh, maintain a reasonable level of performance. So that's one thing to note. Um, and then there are existing large batch uh, uh, optimizers does not seem to be successful. Um, and the third uh, observation with VIT is that uh, we find batch normalization is still helpful uh, in the VIT backbone. So VIT, because it's a direct adapt of uh, uh, transformers from an NLP, uh, the normalization parameters, uh, the normalization layers in VIT are all uh, layer normalization. Uh, but what we see is that batch normalization uh, when it is replacing layer normalization in the in the backbone, it can still help uh, for vision. Um, and um, but there's an interesting behavior that when BN is uh, uh, applied to self-attention blocks in VIT, uh, it does not seem to be 
uh, in, uh, does not seem to be stable. Uh, so that's uh, um, an open research topic. So here we show the envelopes uh, of different methods. Um, so SimClear V2 and Bio, uh, they are very competitive uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this curve. Uh, with VIT, uh, we show similar trend over there with respect to uh, different model size. Um, batch norm seems to be helpful a little bit, but the envelope is uh, uh, still similar. Uh, yeah. Um, and this is, I think it's one hour uh, already, but I'm going to finish. Um, so there are several takes, takeaways for this talk. The first one is we show that a simple CMS network uh, can work alone without uh, negatives, without large batch, or without momentum encoders. Um, and with the current design, it seems like stop gradient operation is crucial. Um, and we, hyp we hypothesis that it's following uh, uh, different optimization trajectory with this uh, stop gradient operation. Um, and then we argue that CMS networks is a, is a general and a powerful tool to uh, learn invariance. Um, and we show that uh, CMS network based self supervised learning method can transfer well to other backbones like VIT. So that's about about it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes, great presentation. Thank you. Uh, questions, please. Do we have questions? So, uh, yes. Uh, so I had a question for visual transformer. Uh, I was not sure how exactly you use. You just replace the ResNet with the visual transformer, but you still have this projection MLP head. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So uh, we just replace the encoder part okay. of uh, of the of each frameworks. Um, like different frameworks have different uh, attachments, like uh, the uh, the predictor or the sinkhole uh, algorithm. But uh, we replace that with the encoder. And this visual transformer, I don't remember exactly because I read a long time ago, I didn't use it, but it seems they do kind of patch-based representation of the images. And yes. Have this transformer to encode the position of the patches and also features. And then we have this kind of uh, prediction head at the top for classification. Um, yes. So there is a, a special token called the class token. Um, mm -hmm. um, so you have a patch embedding, uh, which is dividing an image uh, into uh, 16 by 16, uh, a series of uh, 16 by 16 patches and attach that with, uh, uh, so now it's a sequence, a sequential representation of image. And then uh, you attach that with a, a class token uh, and then uh, feed that into uh, a transformer, uh, like a sentence. Uh, so that's that's pretty much about it. Um, and then in the end, it takes um, the class tokens output to uh, as a representation of the entire image. Um, it can also work without class tokens. So um, just feed the, this sequence of tokens, and then uh, in the end, the, it outputs a sequence of of uh, output tokens, and uh, one can do average pooling of yeah. uh, all the tokens, like in ResNet. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah. Because uh, but it's kind of modeling the relationship between the patches of the image. Very high level. Yeah. Uh, one thing we find interesting is that um, on ImageNet, it seems like position embedding is not that crucial. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, we can just entirely remove uh, position embedding and it only drops like 2% of, uh, of performance over there. So this means that one can like 
to perform the ImageNet classification task well, one can just uh, do patchification uh, and then uh, exactly. still do well over there. Uh, yeah. Okay, questions, please. Yeah, I have one question. Uh, could you clarify, please, because I'm not really familiar with this Sinclair strategy. Uh, can you show your results on ImageNet? That's uh, why. Sure. As I understood, all your training is just self supervised when you train some abstract features, right? Uh, before sorry. That, I mean, before this ImageNet, you don't have any labels, right? You just do self supervised learning. Mm -hmm. in some metric ways and, and then how you get uh, results on ImageNet to show like all training sets to it with, with all labels based on this pre-trained uh, encoder or or what oh so it's a uh, it's uh, actually a very uh, uh, counterintuitive uh, or maybe a weird setup um, so one first pre-trained ImageNet removing all the labels so there's only this set of images and uh, we apply this self-supervised learning methods on um, this set of images without the labels. Um, and then it gives a, as an output, it gives a, a, a pre-trained encoder. And when, uh, when reporting these numbers, what we do is uh, uh, we still go back to the training set uh, and we use the encoder, the pre-trained encoder to extract uh, features. Uh, uh, and these features are fixed. So the encoder weights are fixed. It does not get updated. And each image uh, has a representation. And uh, on the training set, we just train uh, a linear classifier on top of the representation. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. evaluate it on the validation set. I see. So uh, on pre-trained feature encoder, you just train some one layer classifier mm -hmm. and get these results, right? Yes, yes. Okay, cool. Thank you. I have one more question about maybe the training itself. Could you show any slide with your uh, scheme with with or without gradient? Yes. Encoder and predictor. Yeah, here. The, yeah, oh, that's, is this one? Uh, yeah, just about scheme. Um, so after that, you uh, you clarified why you did exactly this. Uh, it's akin to strategy with alternate alternating training, right? Like in some sense, on the right branch you fix your um, representation, and on the left it's just some random or not random, sorry, okay, abstract um, uh, training of the network, right? So it's like alternating steps between them. Uh, what if you uh, step gradient not here, but maybe on the of the encoder on the left? What would it mean? Does it make sense or not? Um, so there are two types of uh, stop gradient. So one type of stop gradient is uh, uh, just stop gradient after predictor. So on top of a predictor, there there's a second type is stop gradient on uh, between the predictor edge yeah, and yeah, uh, yeah. encoder F. So uh, we try so we try the second type um, because we the predictor edge still has weights, right? So uh, if we stop gradient uh, after predictor edge, uh, then the encoder F is being trained because the gradient is uh, passed on the right side, but the predictor does not get trained. The predictor has random weights. So that intuitively does not work for us. So what we have tried is, uh, uh, with the stop gradient between predictor edge and encoder F. Uh, what we find is that it can still collapse, I think. Uh, we didn't report that in the in the paper, but uh, it still collapse uh, in the in the in that variant. And our explanation that uh, it's important to pass gradient uh, uh, to encoder F through predictor uh, uh, seems like the, the, the gradient directly received from uh, uh, 
uh, encoder uh, from the loss function to encoder F is uh, less stable. And uh, uh, through the predictor H, uh, the, the, the gradient is more stable. Um, well, yeah. that's actually quite interesting result, right? Because it's it's not uh, what what we expect. I would expect that results would not really be too different between these two approaches, between this that you you have on the, on the slide and one that you just create now. Mm. But you are saying that they collapse, right? Yeah, uh, I think it. Yeah, it's. Uh, Yeah, it's an interesting result. Uh, we didn't report that in the uh, in the paper, uh, but reviewers did ask uh, in uh, for for this work. Uh, yeah. Okay. And uh, just to clarify, then, uh, as uh, for example, if you then fine tune this um, with some linear classifier for ImageNet, you use only encoder, right? You use only encoder features, not predictor outputs. Yes, yes. It's actually only part of the encoder. So the encoder F consists of a, a, the, the backbone and the pr projector. So uh, I skipped it through that, but... Um, so there's a, a projector within the encoder as well. So this projector is uh, introduced from Sinclair. So one of the contribution for SimClear is that they introduce this extra MLP head. Uh, and uh, that seems to be uh, very helpful for representation learning. Uh, or actually like removing the gap, uh, serve as, as a gap between instance discrimination between the, the pre-training task and the, the fine tuning uh, task for classification. Um, yeah, okay, thank you. Yep. Yep, please. Chen Zhou. May I ask a small question? Yeah, sure. Uh, you just mentioned that the uh, position information is not that crucial on ImageNet. Mm -hmm. Could you please explain more about it? Um, I think there are several signs for, uh, for ImageNet. Uh, there are works um i think it's also from uh from some yeah so there are works from uh, uh i clear in 2019 or 18 i forgot uh, that shows that i resonate with one by one convolution so everything one by one convolution uh it can still reach a reasonable performance on image net so and and they such they are suggesting that uh, on ImageNet, uh, textures are more important than uh, the shapes of uh, objects uh, to 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 do the classification task well. Uh, uh, and I think our finding uh, resonates with uh, that uh, that finding uh, because uh, what we find is that you just need a small patches, bags of small patches to uh, represent the image. Uh, and uh, the actual position embedding, uh, which may respond, uh, correspond to shapes uh, of the whole object uh, does not matter uh, that much. Uh, uh, but that's our assumption. Uh, I think in NLP, there's a very different uh, behavior over there. Position embedding is very important uh, for uh, for NLP, uh, but at least on this ImageNet task, it does not seem to be uh, helpful. Uh, I think for other vision tasks, uh, um, it should be uh, helpful. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, that's actually one limitation of the current uh, self-supervised learning research uh, that people are mostly referring or uh, reporting numbers on uh, ImageNet uh, and uh, with quite little 
downstream transfer to other tasks, especially maybe related to 3D understanding of images uh, or uh, tasks that require more uh, geometric understanding of images. Uh, it's mostly about image, net, uh, image classification or uh, recognition tasks. Um, I think much be because of noisy labels uh, on ImageNet might be another reason because uh, in, in the recent SOAP paper, the extension of this paper also, they train on the Instagram images and they mm -hmm. transfer to many different downstream tasks for vision data sets. Mm -hmm. You mean the SEER work, right? S-E-E-R. Yeah, exactly. yes. yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think Moco and uh, I think in Moco V1, uh, Kaimin has tried uh, to train on Instagram uh, data as well. Uh, but our current belief is that uh, these self-supervised uh, tasks does not seem to scale well uh, when it comes to a larger set of data. Uh, it shows improvement on uh, uh, Moco V1 paper that uh, it improves a little bit, but uh, that is with much longer training. And our common uh, belief is that with longer training, these self-supervised learning methods in general perform well. Yeah, um, this, yeah, matches with the observation of the seer paper as well. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I think it's an open research question to find approaches that uh, scale really well uh, to large data, like uh, what's happening now in NLP. Um, okay, do we have more questions? I have a some questions about this. Uh, can we just extend to multi view more than two views? Like uh, in similar to multi crop. Mm -hmm. So I I think maybe we need to kind of replicate these encoders with the stop gradients. We have one center encoder with the predictor head, and for other views we can have uh, encoders with, without uh, with a stop gradient, basically, right? Mm -hmm. I think it. Can so our position about uh, multi crop or multi view is that it complicates things. Uh, so uh, it, it's a quite helpful trick uh, for introduced by Swalf or maybe some previous works, uh, but it complicates things. Uh, like in our exploration of uh, VIT. Uh, it can be, uh, there are extra uh, design choices we have to make uh, when we, uh, when we uh, do studies on the um, multi-crops. Uh, it can improve performance, uh, but it's, uh, it's complicating things. And that's going against the theme of uh, SimSiam that we want to simplify things. Uh, but our belief is that uh, it can be extended to uh, multiple views. Uh, it should be, although we haven't uh, tried. And another remark on uh, multiple view is that uh, it's actually similar to uh, uh, training longer uh, because multiple view is, is if effectively like cropping eight yeah. views of on the same image uh, versus uh, uh, cropping two views of the same image, then that's like 4x uh, the data. Uh, yeah. And that's a smart way to uh, implicitly train longer without yeah. appear to, to train longer. Yeah. So um, yeah, we, for, for comparisons for, for this kind of exploration, we didn't. Uh, do the multi-view, although, yeah, I mean, 